It's a pleasure for me to do uh, Paul Thompson. Paul is uh, kind of the, the leader in the area that I like to do philosophy in, in agriculture and environmental ethics and bioethics and science and technology. Kind of uh, opened the field, if you would, for academics with his book, Spirit of the Soil, uh, where he talked about agriculture and environmental ethics. And um, one recommendation is when we advertised this program a couple years ago, we sent it out to various universities around the country and scientists called me up to see if this was a legit program and whether or not he would uh, actually recommend it to his students and I go well Paul Thompson's here he goes well he's good so it somehow gave him the uh, credibility so I think scientists admire Paul's work so um, with that we'll let Paul take over to talk about value judgments risk uh, acceptability for GMO Okay, uh, before I actually start the talk, I'm going to do a, a plug, and uh, I don't actually expect graduate students to buy this book, but I do expect you to all go back and insist that your library order it. Um, this is uh, just came out this year. It's called What Can Nanotechnology Learn from Biotechnology? So it covers two out of the three uh, areas for uh, debating science. Uh, it's a book that uh, uh, some colleagues and I put together, chapters by uh, experts from all over the world who have either participated in or studied the debate over GMOs. And the rationale for doing this is that uh, uh, one of the most frequently heard things in connection with nanotechnology is that we don't want to make the same mistakes that people did with GMOs. But most of the people who say those things have absolutely no idea what the mistakes were uh, with respect to GMOs. So we wrote this book to try to summarize some of that. Uh, and I'm going to actually uh, send it to the back of the room and let you pass it around um, while I'm talking. You can just kind of peruse the uh, table of contents. Um, I actually kind of think of the GMO. I'm, as Dane said, trained in philosophy. Um, a lot of what I do is not recognizable as philosophy to many philosophers. Uh, some of it looks more like policy analysis and uh, work in the social sciences. I stopped worrying about that a long time ago. Uh, but I do kind of think of the, the GMO uh, debate as a series of overlapping episodes. And uh, uh, I can um, talk for literally days about this without repeating the same thing. Uh, and I um, am not allowed to do that here. Uh, so I'm going to really try to focus on what obviously is one of the more central episodes, and that has to do uh, with the regulation of GMOs. Uh, and, but even still, I'm not going to uh, produce a particularly logical or, or well-ordered argument working about uh, regulation, but I'm going to, to try to kind of take a stroll through some of the issues that have been uh, debated in connection with uh, uh, GMOs. And uh, as Alan actually suggested in one of the slides that he skipped through, uh, one of the main ways in which this debate has been framed uh, is um, through uh, this idea that there's a, uh, there are these contrary principles that are being put forward. Uh, one uh, referred to as substantial equivalence and the second referred to as a precautionary principle. Now before I get into that, I want to actually, I actually just added this slide, um, but I want to actually say just a little bit specifically in a descriptive sense about the way we actually do regulate GMOs in the United States. And we do this um, under a, uh, a set of, uh, an, uh, it's hard to figure out what the hell it is, but it's called the coordinated framework. And it's essentially an, an agreement among regulatory agencies uh, to uh, work together in regulating GMOs. And the basic logic behind the coordinated framework is that there are certain kinds of hazards or unwanted outcomes that might be associated with GMOs, 
Um, and there are laws uh, and federal agencies that are addressed to those kinds of hazards. Uh, in fact, none of these laws were passed uh, specifically to address GMOs. All of them existed uh, well before um, uh, 1990 when people first seriously started proposing uh, introducing uh, genetically modified crops or organisms in, into the environment or the food system. Um, you know, so, and, and so the basic logic, this is a very schematic sort of uh, outline, is that you know, concerns that relate to food safety and public health pretty broadly are regulated by the Food and Drug Administration. Uh, their authorizing legislation goes back to 1906, uh, and it's been amended a number of times, but essentially uh, they're, trying, they're using principles that were developed to uh, address food safety long before anybody uh, had a thought about genetically modified organisms. For veterinary health, uh, that is primarily at FDA, although there are some specific animal welfare questions that relate more to research um, and, and weakly to, uh, uh, to the condition of animals in production systems that are under, FDA, under USDA. Uh, there's a major component of the regulatory system that's focused on disease vectors and invasive species. And that is regulated by uh, the uh, Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, which uh, us insiders like to refer to sort of fondly as APHIS. Uh, APHIS uh, regulates those. That's considered to be a component of environmental risk. Um, um, most people think of environment with the Environmental Protection Agency, but the Environmental Protection Agency actually only regulates toxic exposures that are environmental as opposed to any sorts of toxins that might be associated with consuming uh, a product uh, as, a, as a kind of intentionally introduced food substance, right? I know some of you are nodding your heads like you know what I'm talking about, but this is an enormously complicated picture, and certainly one of the problems um, in the debate has been just the sheer complexity of the coordinated framework and the fact that everybody concedes that there are certain kinds of things that kind of fall through the cracks on this coordinated framework. Now down at the bottom I've added that there, one of those things that fell through the cracks in the early years has to do with, with certain commerce that takes place in GMOs. Uh, and I'm thinking primarily about labeling products from GMOs. And this wasn't originally addressed in the coordinated framework. Um, the uh, U.S. agency that has the clear legal authority to, to uh, regulate this is the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, but the Federal Trade Commission doesn't know the first thing about food or genetic engineering, so they actually ro rely in a somewhat informal way upon uh, FDA for most of the advice about what kind of regulations uh, they should develop for that. I put those in black because even today those aren't considered to be officially part of the coordinated framework and there is this meeting of regulators, I don't know how often they're meeting these days, uh, where, that, where you have representatives from all of these agencies and I don't think anybody from FTC attends those meetings. I, I can't swear to that fact but I, I don't think that's the case. Even still there are major issues that get left out uh, and those actually relate to the social impact of GMOs. Um, you know, how does this affect uh, uh, farming? How does it affect rural communities? How does it affect, uh, uh, you know, what's going on uh, in terms of uh, uh, the, the relative size of farms or uh, their relationships with uh, commercial entities and so on? Uh, and in fact, the federal government doesn't regulate any of that in the United States. And the place where the authority to regulate that resides uh, is within state state and county level governments. Uh, and as Alan mentioned in his presentation, there have been some attempts to regulate uh, at the county level and they've been quite uh, controversial and there's also been um, laws passed in a number of states uh, that prohibit legislation at the county level. We have one of those laws in Michigan uh, and it's a state law. So that, these are essentially decisions that the federal government uh, has opted out of. Uh, and uh, they really kind of complicate this uh, even more. It's not really part of the coordinated framework, uh, but it's a, a, a clear set of, uh, of regulatory issues that are quite important. Um, one of the things that you could talk about, although I'm not going to talk about this, but this is an interesting thing to talk about, is whether this is a good way to regulate biotechnology. 
And uh, most people who are not Americans don't think it is. And uh, certainly one of the substantive debates um, uh, has been whether or not um, there should be a, a kind of unified agency uh, that regulates uh, um, uh, GMOs. And I actually don't support that. I think that this framework makes more sense than it looks like at first. Uh, but I did want to at least kind of put this up there so that you had some appreciation of, of how this is actually done. I'm going to talk uh, more philosophically about some of the principles that get applied in making some of these regulatory decisions than I am about the, the basic regulatory structure. Does anybody have any questions before I move on from this slide? I don't want to spend, you know, 10 or 15 minutes, but I'd be happy to answer one or two questions if anybody has any. I should, yeah. Uh, it's the coordinated framework meeting, right? So, so they they have, and here, you know, I only know this because uh, I've uh, uh, talked to people who are representatives to the coordinated framework meeting. But, but the idea is that they've got these laws, right? And they know that they overlap, and they know that there are gaps. So they try to meet regularly to see whether or not they're they're comfortable as regulatory agencies with the way the framework's working. And it's, in some respects, an informal kind of process. Um, it's, uh, uh, and uh, I have read one or two law review articles about it. I, I don't know uh, to what extent, say, someone could sue the federal government and say, you know, we don't like the coordinated framework. Those would be really good questions to ask an attorney, but, uh, uh, or somebody who's into regulatory law, but I'm, I couldn't answer those questions. Okay. Yeah. Uh, in an earlier presentation, I think I mentioned about the uh, Variation in GMO regulations across different countries. Right. I'd like to know, like, if there is an attempt to reach a consensus on a global scale with regards to these regulations. Uh, I don't think there's any active attempt to do that. Are, are you aware of anything? Uh, on, a, on a regulatory basis? Yeah. Well, I mean, you might, you might consider Codex. Yeah. The labeling, at least. But, um, yeah, Codex is, a, is an agency that runs through uh, uh, the, uh, I'm blanking. Um, uh, FAO, the Food and Agricultural Organization of the, the UN, and they are uh, an, a, a, an organization whose specific purpose is to harmonize international relation, uh, regulations as they relate mainly to food safety. There are, if I might interject here, uh, a fair number of informal get-togethers with the various national regulators, um, the Europeans, U.S., Canada, uh, China, other countries, they, they get together on a fairly regular basis, but these are almost unofficial. Uh, you know, the, the players all know each other on a personal level, so they like to keep it unofficial, because once once they codify it and regularize it, it becomes political. Um, but at, uh, at, at the level where the work gets done with the regulators, uh, they do keep in pretty close contact on various uh, new GMOs that may be coming to the system and they, they share information quite openly. Do you yeah. think there should be a global consensus on this thing? Well, you know, it's one of those things that I guess the, the, the short answer to that is that knowing something about how hard it is to put together a global consensus, I am not really sure it would be worth the effort. You know, I mean, in some ideal sense, if you know, it, it seems like it would be nice and it would certainly simplify certain kinds of questions, but um, you know, that's not going to be an easy thing to reach. I mean, in fact, you know, there's not really a deep consensus even among these federal agencies of the United States government, right? I mean, they work it out and they, you know, they get along with one another, but, you know, uh, you know the, the term regulated article is a APHIS term, right? It's actually not a term that means anything at FDA, right? So, you know, it's, it's in some respects, a worse than Alan made it out to be. There actually was a, an official discussion of GMOs at the uh, latest round of World uh, Trade Organization. Doha round. But those discussions collapsed. And I, I've read sort of non-official reports that GMO regulation is one of the many reasons that was, uh, amongst others, the agricultural part that Right. Right. I mean, this is a, still an amazingly controversial uh, issue, and uh, there have been any number of international efforts that have collapsed over the last four or five years <laughs> over GMOs. The, I was going to mention the OECD does have their, their scientific body to bring together the consensus documents on the biology of different species uh, related to, to GMOs. Okay. So there is that common. Yeah. 
technical level of you know, the kinds of concerns you should have with, with corn, if you have a, if you see an application for a genetically modified corn, the kinds of questions you as a regulator should ask the developer. Um, and that, that's operated through the OECD, so that, that's fairly international in scope. And, yeah. and quite widely respected as well as a scientific entity. What I want to try to do in my main um, talk, as I already said, was to, to be a little more philosophical and not quite so legal or, or, or uh, uh, specific to the, the, the way the debates play out, and to really try to ask the question, uh, the extent to which these ideas of substantial equivalence on the one hand and precautionary principle on the other uh, really do influence the way that people think about these uh, regulatory type decisions. Uh, and in some cases, uh, you know, this has very little bearing on the way regulations are actually made and the way uh, things are done, but I do think that there are some interesting things to uh, think through and debate just in terms of trying to understand uh, how these principles are developed and how they're applied uh, by various uh, parties to the debate. Um, I'm going to start out by saying just a little bit about the precautionary principle. I'm going to give a much more uh, extended discussion of substantial equivalence uh, before I come around to talking about uh, both of them uh, 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 in, in somewhat brief form in terms of the way that they've actually uh, interacted in the biotech debate. Now, um, the precautionary principle uh, has its roots uh, in a book written by a philosopher named Hans Jonas, who was a German. Um, died about uh, 15 years ago, and uh, the book was originally published in the 1970s uh, in, uh, um, in uh, Germany. I'll get into these details a little bit more. Um, a second way to really frame the precautionary principle debate and the way that it's been uh, framed much more uh, uh, substantively in recent years uh, is what's called uh, the strong precautionary principle, and I'll get into a little bit of what that is, uh, and, and a little bit uh, weaker um, approach is actually, rather than talking about a precautionary principle, is to talk broadly uh, about a precautionary approach, uh, which actually might be compatible with the idea of ri doing risk assessment on the one hand, or it's sometimes understood as an alternative to risk assessment. A uh, book on the market, I uh, can't recall the author right now, uh, suggests that we ought to stop doing risk assessment and just start using the precautionary principle. Uh, and we'll get into some of that a little bit uh, towards the end. So uh, Hans Jonas uh, wrote a book called Das Prinzip Verantwortung, um, which was translated into English as uh, The Principle of Responsibility. Uh, it was uh, subsequently um, uh, revised a bit in German and then sort of came back to us as the precautionary principle. Um, but generally, uh, what uh, Jonas's book was about, written again in the 1970s, was just a, a general appeal for humanity to be much more responsible uh, in choosing technologies. And it's actually quite reasonable to read this book today and, and think that what Jonas was asking us to do was to do risk assessment of novel technologies. Uh, you know, he wanted us to be systematic, to apply technology in order to understand technology, uh, to try to understand what the consequences are and be thoughtful uh, about uh, bringing uh, new technologies into widespread use and application. Um, the, he has actually a, a, a principle which uh, he identifies uh, as, uh, in the English version, the principle of responsibility uh, in the book. Uh, and that is, it's specifically, as he describes it, it's, it's that we should forswear all acts that have any chance of ending human autonomy. Right? Now, what does that mean? Well, he gives several examples in the book. And the first thing that he was clearly thinking about in the 1970s was nuclear annihilation. If we blow up ourselves and make the world uninhabitable by humans, we have not only killed a lot of people, which is a bad thing, but we have actually uh, ended sort of uh, the, the possibility of any human being having any sense of freedom or uh, you know, having any, any chance of, uh, of thinking ethically, right? Uh, he also gives uh, substantial discussion to uh, technologies of behavior modification. Uh, we don't hear a lot about these today, but they were much uh, hotter in the 1970s. Uh, has anybody read the book or seen the film Clockwork Orange? Okay, quite a few of you, great. So this is a, a novel from the 
uh, early 70s about uh, uh, you know this uh, tough kid in England who gets into these behavior mod therapies and and uh, you know uh, you know uh, goes into pain whenever he hears Beethoven's Ninth and so on. You know, totally different story. But at any rate, the idea was that that you know behavior modification is a technology in Jonas's view uh, that has the threat uh, of actually ending our ability to uh, act autonomously to that is to to understand ourselves and to drive our sense of ethics uh, reflectively and to have a certain amount of freedom with respect to that so he considered behavior mod to be one of these uh, technologies that the precautionary principle uh, would uh, our way against and then in one sentence he mentions genetic engineering he doesn't tell us in any sense what kind of genetic engineering he's imagining. Uh, he doesn't tell us uh, uh, whether he's thinking about genetically engineering humans. That's the most plausible thing to think, given that this comes at the end of a discussion of, uh, of, uh, of uh, behavior modification. But at any rate, you know, it is on the list even in the 1970s book. Um, <clears throat> This actually comes very much out of Europe, um, you know, very much out of people who are reading the German. The book was much more widely read uh, in Europe than it was in the United States, although it was widely read in the United States. Uh, and uh, but the the phrase precautionary principle, uh, you know, sort of comes back uh, uh, without really a lot of understanding of its roots in Jonas's philosophy, uh, and winds up being included in the Rio Declaration uh, in the con in the Convention on Biodiversity. Uh, in 1992, uh, and the, the short version here is this idea that lack of scientific certainty shall not be used as a reason uh, to postpone measures uh, that prevent environmental degradation. That's not a full quote, but um, a substantial quote out of the text of the Rio Declaration. Now many people have interpreted this, and this is the strong precautionary principle view, uh, that this provides a rationale uh, to uh, ban GM crops, right? Because um, you know they're, uh, you know, we shouldn't, you know, wait until we're sure that they're going to uh, kill us or or degrade the environment before we ban them. Uh, you know, the fact that we aren't sure that they they might do this uh, isn't a reason to uh, to to uh, uh, you know be slow about banning them. Let's go ahead and ban them right now, right? Now, uh, a philosopher named Gary Comstock writes very very good stuff on uh, genetic engineering, uh, has written a very nice piece on the precautionary principle uh, in which he argues, I think quite convincingly, that this principle also implies uh, that we should pursue genetically engineered crops. Um, why? Well, because uh, you know, industrial agriculture is currently uh, uh, you know, uh, causing tremendous amount of environmental degradation uh, and uh, genetically engineered crops uh, provide one way to reverse or mitigate some of the harm that's associated uh, with industrial agriculture. Uh, so um, we shouldn't allow our doubts about whether or not genetic engineering really will help us uh, uh, um, overcome the problems associated with industrial agriculture uh, to you know, pursue us, to, to dissuade us from pursuing genetically engineered crops. That's what lack of, the lack of scientific certainty principle tells us. So therefore, on precautionary grounds, uh, we, ought, we ought to actually pursue genetically engineered crops. Now Comstock's point is not to seriously argue this, but to argue that the principle is so open-ended that it implies both a ban on genetically engineered crops and pursuing genetically engineered crops. And so his general point is that this strong interpretation of the precautionary principle uh, is actually kind of meaningless. Um, and I, I think that among serious advocates of the precautionary principle uh, that I in encounter, uh, many of them get very impatient with Comstock's type argument. And what they'll say is that really what we in, uh, you know, are insisting on uh, is a more precautionary approach. Uh, certainly within the context of, um, of, of uh, regulation of toxic substances, uh, we have had a history of being much too slow uh, to regulate toxic substances and the courts 
have had a history of being much too slow to award uh, people that had been uh, harmed by t exposure to toxic substances with, um, with, with uh, coming down with legal judgments that would uh, rule in the favor of uh, injured parties. Uh, so within that sort of a context, uh, the suggestion is that what, what the precautionary approach really suggests is uh, a, you know, roughly a number of things, one of which is uh, that uh, we should minimize type 2 errors uh, rather than type 1 errors when we're thinking in a, uh, a risk context. Uh, the idea here is that uh, uh, when you're in a scientific context, uh, you're normally trained to um, minimize the chance of uh, accepting uh, a claim, uh, uh, accepting a claim as true uh, when it might be false. Um, whereas, uh, if what you're interested in doing is minimizing the chance that uh, uh, somebody's going to be harmed, you want to minimize the chance of uh, accepting um, a claim that might be true, uh, even if it uh, is in fact false. So this is actually a statistical, you know, there's a, a statistical test here that that uh, uh, sorts out the range of type 1 and type 2 errors. So basically, you're just applying your, your statistics in two uh, different ways here. Um, a second uh, principle that's associated in the precautionary approach uh, is that you should really make uh, uh, relatively conservative uh, uh, assumptions uh, when you're uh, assessing risks associated with anything. Uh, so and my uh, favorite example of a conservative assumption, I did some work in nuclear power risk assessment when I was uh, right out of graduate school. And uh, uh, we were doing an empirical assessment of a nuclear power plant. And we had to assign probabilities uh, to the uh, likelihood that uh, any particular engineering system would work properly or would fail in an accident scenario. And so uh, we were out uh, wandering around in the plant and we came across this valve uh, which was actually critical to one of the safety systems in the plant and spray painted on the wall behind this valve was a sign that read, this valve works backwards. <laughs> and we had to assign a probability to uh, the likelihood that that valve was going to operate properly in an accident scenario. And so, you know, in the, in the spirit of making a conservative assumption, we just assumed it was going to fail, right? That's kind of the, the spirit of this make conservative assumptions, right? We, we didn't want to seriously try to calculate the probability that somebody was going to come in in an accident scenario and figure out how to operate a, a valve with contrary, contradictory uh, instructions um, uh, properly. Uh, sec uh, another thing that's uh, associated with a precautionary approach is that we really shouldn't require proof of harm uh, before acting. And this is something that's particularly relevant in a uh, tort context and a legal context. Uh, um, you know, it's very difficult to prove that somebody's cancer was caused by uh, an exposure from the chemical plant next door. Uh, but, uh, you know, perhaps that's too high a burden of proof uh, in a context like that. Uh, and, and a fourth element here is, is what's called the minimax type of decision rule. And this is a, a uh, uh, a principle in decision making where uh, you minimize the chance that the worst case scenario will actually occur. So if you're talking nuclear power again, uh, you uh, try to minimize the chance that you're going to have a Chernobyl style meltdown, uh, even if that may raise the probability that you're going to have uh, accidents that are expensive in the plant or something like that. So uh, basically these are, are some of the principles that uh, are, are critical to a precautionary approach. Now if we look at what's actually done in risk assessment, um, it's almost, yes? Um, from the second and the third points, um, uh -huh. yeah, I don't really get how Comstock's uh, argument against um, being conservative on genetically modified crops come to work because you don't know whether the soil is going to get degraded or I mean, whether there's going to be soil um, degradation because it's being proved from use, use of genetically modified crops. I mean, I know the Indian scenario. You're requiring more fertilizers and pesticides along with uh, the, the resistant, uh, like the pesticide resistant crops that have been used. So, I mean, I don't, I don't really get how Comstock's argument actually uh, also means the same statement that the precaution. Well, the idea behind Comstock's argument is that if, if you're, let me back up here, right? So if you're, if you're in a, um, uh, 
uh, in, in, a, in a situation where um, you don't really, you know, have, you may have evidence, right, but do you know for certain that, uh, um, that uh, using uh, genetically engineered crops is going to cause soil erosion? Uh, soil degradation, do you know that for certain? I mean, there may be evidence that suggests that, but do you know that for certain? No, you don't, right? So lack of certainty shouldn't be a reason why we don't go ahead and, you know, just plow right ahead with these genetically engineered crops. And so then the definition of certainty comes from the future, right? I mean, what do you mean? How much of evidence do you need for certainty to be? Right. Right. Now everybody, I mean, I think any philosopher will, cons will certainly encourage you to get into talking about the definition of certainty, but certainly the, pr but the principle behind the uh, strong application of the precautionary principle is that when there is uncertainty, you don't have to pay attention to the science. Okay? You just do kind of what common sense is. But people's common sense is contrary, right? So I think Comstock's actually got a, a, a good argument here, right? It's, it's, you know, you really can't deploy science and evidence within a context in which lack of certainty, um, lack of scientific certainty, uh, is a criterion for ignoring science. I mean, that's exactly what it says. Lack of scientific certainty shall not be a as, used as a reason to postpone measures to, and to prevent environmental harm, right? So given that people have very different ideas of what preventing environmental harm is, basically what this principle is telling you is that unless you're scientifically certain, right, which is a very min minuscule number of cases, uh, the science just doesn't count. I mean, it is kind of a nutty principle for anybody who, you know, is, at le you know, is in any sense, you know, kind of inclined toward science, okay? I mean, I think your point is that evidence should count. <laughs> <laughs> which Comstock agrees with, okay? Uh, let me, I was about to kind of make the case that in fact a lot of these things are taken in, case, in account in risk assessment and it's just generally the case that when you're doing risk assessment as distinct from trying to develop a, uh, a claim that you can publish in a scientific journal, you minimize type 2 errors rather than type 1 errors, a totally different burden of proof, something that's important for people in the sciences to understand uh, and I don't think that it's understood as widely as it should be. But the burdens of proof, the statistical methods that are used in risk assessment are not the statistical methods that are used in establishing a hypothesis uh, for, uh, the stand from the standpoint of whether this ought to be regarded as an accepted theoretical claim. And this actually addresses your point pretty directly, okay? Because uh, the idea here is that if there is statistical uncertainty, right, you, um, you accept the most conservative, that is, the, you, don't wanna, you don't want to, as long as there's some statistically supportable uh, suggestion that this is a harm, right, that there is a, a, a causal relationship here, uh, the rule of minimizing type 2 errors tells you to uh, go on the, on the, you don't want to eliminate the possibility that this is a harmful substance, right? So this is actually, within the context of this, I mean, this is a precautionary approach, and it actually is not an uncommon practice. It's not universal, but it's not an uncommon practice among people that consider themselves to be risk assessors. Um, sa same thing about conservative assumptions, right? The practice in general in risk assessment is to make conservative assumptions. Uh, you get into debates within the context of doing a risk assessment about whether or not uh, you should make a particular conservative assumption, but this is generally done. Uh, I think these other two are a little bit less clear uh, and uh, it's certainly not the case that in risk assessment, minimax rules are uh, always or even most frequently applied. Uh, but uh, these are at least things that get debated within the context of actually doing uh, a risk assessment. Um, the the, the, the take-home point from this before I start getting into substantial equivalence is that um, I really just don't buy the idea that uh, the pre precautionary approach is an alternative to risk assessment. I mean, I think people who do risk assessment and know what risk assessment is um, are actually quite sensitive to a lot of the things that are suggested by people who are arguing for a precautionary approach. Uh, and uh, um, so, you know, one thing that I'll stand up in front of Congress and say is that I think this 
debate between precaution and risk assessment is a red herring. It's just not really a particularly meaningful debate. So let me get into substantial equivalence. I'm going to run really short here if I don't start moving. Uh, and I want to break this down into three things. I want to actually talk at some length about how this principle is actually used at, at the Food and Drug Administration. That's the place where it has a home in the coordinated framework. Uh, and then I also want to talk about how uh, this principle has been used or publicized at the, through the World Health Organization and the FAO uh, because they have also uh, promulgated uh, ideas about substantial equivalence. Um, and both of these are relevant to the biotech debate. So again, just generally, the Food and Drug Administration uh, has uh, two primarily responsibilities, one of which is to regulate food safety uh, and then uh, also has some cosmetics, other things that are kind of on the edges, but also primarily uh, they're focused on drugs and medical devices. And in some sense, this, the idea of substantial equivalence informs all phases of uh, food and drug administration regulation, but it's most fully developed for drugs and medical devices. Uh, and in fact, um, the specific language of substantial equivalence is meaningful within a US, uh, an FDA regulatory context uh, only within uh, the context of drugs and medical devices. Informally, everybody talks about substantial equivalence with respect to foods, uh, but in fact that's not part of the regulatory language, which is an important point if you're a lawyer. Um, so how does this work in drugs and medical devices? Well, the idea is that you know, you've got a drug approved and you know, you, you know, you've got some sort of pill uh, that helps bald guys grow hair, right? And uh, you've been, and it's been green, right? And you want to put a new pill on the market that's pink, right? And uh, you know, I don't know why, right? You know, use your imagination. Why would somebody want a pink pill instead of a blue, right? But you know, that's not really an inert um, I mean, it's an inert agreement. It's not part of the active uh, drug. Uh, and so you want to change the formulation of the pill, right? Now, FDA actually cares about this. And if you want to do something like that, you have to submit paperwork to FDA, which describes the change that you want to make and, uh, and um, documents your claim that, that, that this is inert and it doesn't affect the operation of the drug. Same thing for medical devices. If you have a, a surgical device or a diagnostic tool, that you've been making out of uh, some kind of plastic and you want to make it out of a new kind of plastic, you have to tell FDA about that, right? Uh, and, uh, and, and so uh, FDA looks at the documentation and either accepts your claim that these are substantially equivalent or doesn't. Uh, and then you either have to kind of go back to the drawing board or, or whatever. Or your alternative is to actually kind of re-enter the whole um, regulatory process again and start submitting data uh, to prove that this new substance is, is just as safe or just as effective as the old one, okay? Um, this is a slide which, uh, uh, sub which summarizes what I just said. It, is this reasonably clear to people, what, what's going on here, right? Now with respect to foods, um, it's uh, a basic idea is similar, right? That uh, uh, you know, foods would be um, substantially equivalent, uh, but there are some important wrinkles to the way that they handle food. Um, first off, um, food regulation at FDA is non-mandatory. Um, with just one or two very specific exceptions, uh, you don't have to have any food or food ingredient regulated by FDA. It's all strictly voluntary. Right? So while drugs are mandatory and the FDA really has some teeth with respect to these substantial equivalence rules and you know, if somebody changes the color of their pills and they don't notify FDA, FDA is going to be, they're going to come after them and they're going to fine them. Um, FDA can't do anything if somebody changes uh, the ingredients or composition of a food product. It's all strictly mandatory. Uh, and the most important thing in terms of the way uh, uh, this principle works with respect to um, uh, the way it's handled with respect to food has to do with this, uh, what's called GRASS list, right? And GRASS is an acronym for generally regarded as safe. So when someone is asserting that a food is, is uh, substantially equivalent, what's it equivalent to? Well, it's not equivalent to some sort of item that FDA has previously approved. It's, a t it's a equivalent to uh, a food that is generally regarded as safe. Uh, 
Now, what foods are generally regarded as safe, right? Well, raise your hand, tell me what you like to eat, right? I mean, whatever you tell me, it's generally regarded as safe, right? Tomatoes, peas, bacon, all of that stuff. People have been eating it, you know, since forever. Uh, and, 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 you know, back when FDA started uh, regulating food, uh, they put all of the foods that people have been eating forever on this list. And then they, uh, uh, they never did any safety testing. For all we know, you know, eating watermelon, you know, causes hives in some percentage of the population, but it's on the grass list. This is a really basic question, but how, how is this different from the USDA or is there overlap or So you, at USDA doesn't do anything on food safety. So like meat? Meat, okay, good, good point. Actually, USDA, the Food Safety Inspection Service, uh, inspects meat. And what they're primarily looking for are micro microbial contamination, okay? So in terms of a, the, uh, the way that a food might be contaminated by a natural agent, right, uh, the, that falls into the Food Safety Inspection Service, and it's ex actually primarily focused on meats. Um, yeah, you have to have, if you're, if you're a meat processor, you have to have that inspection. I mean, it, to, to sort of speak very broadly, and a, a lawyer would slap me in the face if I heard me say this, but generally speaking, if it's a natural pathogen or something that, you know, like a disease vector, something like that, uh, that's going to fall under USDA, whereas FDA handles all the intentional introductions, all right? So if you, if you, you know, have a new chemical that you think, uh, you know, is going to preserve a food or is going to make it taste nice and crunchy or give it a new flavor or a new color, you know, that goes to FDA, okay? Uh, but if, uh, if we're talking about uh, uh, salmonella or E. coli uh, and we're interested, I mean, nobody's introducing that stuff intentionally um, and it's, a, it's USDA's responsibility to look for it and make sure it doesn't get there accidentally, okay? There's, that's a little bit of an overstatement, but for purposes, hopefully that's good enough, yeah. So if approval for foods is never mandatory, then <coughs> You know, freshly hydrogenated vegetable oil is regulated by no one. Like when that's right. On the market, it was just like, let's eat this. So that's right. Like, it's exactly right. It's really bad for us. Yep. Okay. Yep. It's, and and there is no law that would require them to regulate that. Now, you know, one of the the sort of things that lurks out in the background and has influenced the, the GMO debate is that there are a number of consumer advocacy organizations that have been lobbying the government for 50 years to make food safety mandatory, right? And, you know, some of the reason why some people got into the biotech debate is they, they thought they might get some leverage um, for something that they've been irritated about for a long time and, you know, maybe very good reasons why we should make this mandatory, although it's, it's a debatable point, right? I mean, you know, it, it's expensive, and it also creates barriers to entry, right? You know, um, if you've got regular, if you have to get regulatory approval to get something on the market, you've got to have a whole, you know, legal department and an army of lawyers and, you know, people who do the tests and stuff like that. So there are, you know, is that a good idea? You know, maybe, maybe not. Okay. So, but yes, indeed. <laughs> yeah. We don't know if genetically modified crops, but Still, we are having reservations on them. But many studies suggest that overcooked meats and things like that are carcinogenic. Right. I mean, there are proper evidence for that. Right. Is it, is it proper not to have any reservations or regulation on those things which we know that people are I mean, taking in? Well, the, the answer, the, 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 the is it proper? That's a great philosophical question, right? And it bears on the GMO debate, right? Uh, but the, the, the answer in terms of where we are is that there is no regulation of that under the U.S. regulatory system. Okay? Or any other, or any other in terms of, you know, how, how, yeah, that's... Virtually all foods have anti-nutrients in them. Right. So if we're going to use the basis of the presence of any carcinogen in any amount... Yeah, I'm going to get to that point. Okay. Okay, so, so basically, here's my summary slide. Uh, in terms of the way... Um, uh, substantial equivalent works at FDA. FDA basically takes the manufacturer's description of the modification or change at face value, that is they describe how, how this is being changed, uh, and then um, uh, they consider whether that change could have any impact on safety. Uh, 
and then they uh, um, um, make the for, for for foods the key decision has to do whether or not uh, you've still got something that's generally regarded as safe, right? Is there anything that's non-genetically engineered that fits into this category, right? Well, um, how many people have seen a plant called Brocco flower? Okay. Do you know how, how they got Brocco flower, Alan? I've actually had this explained to me, right? But, but broccoli and cauliflower are basically the same plant, same right? Thing. And so it's just, I don't know how, the, how you sort them out. It's traditional breeding. Okay. It, yeah, there's no genetically engineering in Brocco flower, right? But Brocco flower hadn't been marketed before, right? And so it was fairly straightforward to tell the FDA that basically Brocco flour is not different from either cauliflower or broccoli, right? Because from a certain scientific standpoint, cauliflower and broccoli are not different from one another, right? Um, you know, I happen to like cauliflower better than broccoli, but you know, that's not relevant to the FDA. So, you know, that's an example of how you might apply this principle in general in a case that has nothing to do with uh, genetic engineering. Okay, okay that, that that was that had to go through grass approval and was lobbied heavily against by the soybean people because mm -hmm. they wanted to keep canola oil off the market. Right. Right. Okay. So now let's turn to uh, WHO and FAO. And uh, I don't know if this is uh, still on their website, because uh, it's been a little, it's probably been a, at least been a year since I've looked at the web page. Uh, but WHO, FAO have a, uh, on their lead web page uh, on GMOs, they have uh, some language which draws on a 1993 document uh, from the OECD that was indeed focused on biotech. Uh, and uh, uh, basically, the language um, that they use to describe substantial equivalence on their web page is this. Uh, they call it a dynamic analytical exercise in the safety of a new food relative to an existing food. Um, it's called, uh, uh, so, um, uh, and this, is, this language is on the web page as well. The assessment of the safety of a genetically modified organisms must address both intentional and unintentional effects that may result as a consequence of the genetic modification of the food source. Um, so under this description, substantial equivalence actually sounds like risk assessment. We're going to try to figure out what the unintended and intended effects are, uh, and then we're going to make some sort of a decision. Uh, but the FDA web, I mean the WHO webpage also includes these words. It says, but it is not a safety assessment in itself. Uh, and this uh, has been a source of concern and consternation to a number of uh, uh, groups um, who are trying to figure out what the hell it means if they're describing something that sounds like a safety assessment, but they say it's not a safety assessment. Well, here's my um, um, uh, sort of take on this, and I'm going to uh, do a little bit of a, a sidestep. I'm actually going to argue that there is a kind of social ethics of food that's actually evolved uh, quite a bit over time. Uh, we started out basically with just a notion of whether or not something was edible or not, right? How, we, how did we address uh, food safety uh, in the Neolithic age or in uh, 1700? Well, if it's food, you can eat it. If it's not food, you can't eat it. Uh, and uh, those were the primary questions. Uh, they were, um, that was followed in the 19th century by a science-based approach uh, that uh, we could call uh, purification. Uh, and then finally, uh, and this is the point that Alan was alluded to, really fairly recently, really only in the last 30 years, uh, we've started toward moving towards uh, a risk-based approach to understanding food safety. Now, what I want to argue is that none of these approaches really make sense uh, without the preceding approaches. Um, I'll try to say a little bit more about each of these. This notion of classification, is it food or not, that's just based really on very broad cultural norms. Um, it's often got religious sanction, uh, you know, something's food or not food, uh, based on whether or not it's considered to be uh, um, um, religiously acceptable. 
Uh, and there's really not any clear distinction that's made in these broad classification systems between um, diseases or nutrition or other kinds of broadly healthy types of considerations, right? Um, you know, in, an edible, if a food is edible, it's broadly associated with being both safe to eat but also uh, nutritious and, and wholesome, right? Wholesomeness is a, is, a, is a phrase that we use, that we associate with foods, although it's actually very difficult uh, to use a scientific standard to describe uh, whether a food is wholesome or not. As I was saying, in the 19th century, we actually began to associate uh, um, disease with a number of impurities in foods and water supplies. Uh, and uh, the idea there was that the food itself is safe, uh, but uh, you know things get in it, little bugs get in it, um, or things get added to it. Uh, and the way that you address food safety is to essentially keep things pure. And uh, the original legislation for uh, the uh, Food and Drug Administration actually used the word pure food uh, in, in, its, uh, in its title. Uh, so the idea was, you know, you want to keep things pure, you want to keep the, 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 the nasty bits out, and as long as you're doing that, uh, you're uh, addressing um, food safety. And uh, the phrase pure and wholesome actually still appears in some of the legislation. Uh, and uh, it comes to be seen as a, as a public responsibility. You get um, you know, services that go around and uh, inspect restaurants to make sure they're uh, clean and that uh, you know, they're, they're not letting uh, nasty bits get in the food. As I was saying, this actually changes fairly significantly just um, over most of our lifetime. Some of you may be young enough that this didn't really get started, but it really got started only you know, 25 to 30 years ago. And the idea here is that um, it's not so much a matter of just getting all the nasty bits out. Um, in fact, uh, foods have, uh, all foods are, you know, have components that if you ate too much of it, it would be bad for you. Or if you ate it in a non-balanced or, or uh, uh, you know, without some sort of uh, corresponding, uh, uh, um, you know, if you, you know, you might have a mutagen, but you have anti-mutagens in the food, and they sort of cancel each other out. So you really have to kind of think more about this idea of uh, figuring out what the dose is of a particular toxin uh, in order to really address the question of safety. Uh, so uh, within the food safety agencies, uh, this notion of risk-based uh, thresholds for allowable levels of additives and contaminants, right? You know, you eat a box of cornflakes, there's a certain amount of rat feces in every box of cornflakes, right? So it really isn't something to worry about, at least from a food safety standpoint, although you don't want to sit down and eat a bowl of rat feces, okay? This is my rather inelegant way to explain what's going on here, okay? Um, <clears throat> so, again, we have this grass list already in play, but rather than now sort of thinking of these as, you know, saintly, totally uh, okay type things uh, that uh, couldn't possibly hurt you, there's a recognition uh, that there is stuff in those cornflakes that could hurt you, but, you know, you just don't need to worry about it as long as you're eating a balanced diet. Yeah? Um, this might be a stupid question, but how are these ethics of food safety through time in any way responding to changes in society and the way that it grows and consumes and manufactures and prepares food? I mean, is, is, is this sort of a response to changes in food culture? That's a good question. I actually think that the, the, what I'm describing here is really science-based, right? Uh, that what leads to this kind of purification ideal uh, is the discovery of microbes. Right and uh, uh, and and you know you you start to get new models for disease coming out of the sciences, and how do those get interpreted broadly by the general public? Right. Well, you know people don't all of a sudden start talking about microbes. What they start talking about is pure food. So there is, in some respects, a kind of cultural response to something that's based in science. Right. Now, I frankly don't think we've had the cultural response to risk-based food safety assessment. Right. But I guess what I mean is that like. Risk-based food safety would it have happened if there were no manufacturer of breakfast cereals? You know what I mean? Like just being. So I think what really drove that was 
No, I don't think it was that. I think what, and here, this is, an, you know, probably could be a, a long and interesting conversation in itself, but I think it was actually, again, uh, a, a science-based change that, uh, the you know, toxicologists and nutritionists and food scientists began to understand that, uh, I mean, and this came specifically out of cancer research, that uh, it wasn't as if there were these little nasty bits in your food that caused cancer, and if we just get them out, you know, we'll put an end to cancer, right? Because it was recognized that, you know, tomatoes, potatoes, any kind of food has stuff in it that's potentially mutagenic that could, you know, could under certain circumstances start cancers. But they also have ingredients in there that, that retard those processes, right? So instead of seeing this as something that is a nasty bit that's going to cause disease, uh, you start to get this notion that, well, you know, it's the concentration of the nasty bits and the, uh, the sense in which they're counterbalanced by, you know, anti-nasty bits, right? I'm probably making Alan crazy by this method of describing it, right? But, uh, but you, you get this um, uh, really very different way of thinking about, you know, what the risk is, right? It's not uh, just a sort of an alien invader that's in there that we have to get out, right? Uh, it's, in fact, a fairly complex ecology of ingredients within the food itself, right? And that's what really precipitates this change, okay? Now, certainly things are going on in terms of the, the food system. And, and, you know, one thing that I could mention that kind of supports the idea that, that there's something different is that, uh, uh, you know, we start getting a lot of additives into food in the 1930s. And some of those turned out to be uh, car carcinogens. And uh, uh, the Delaney Clause was, in, uh, was added to the Food and Drug Act, uh, gosh, I think it was in the 50s. I'm not 100% sure what year that was now. And that's a law that basically says that if something is shown to be a carcinogen, uh, it has to be uh, eliminated from food, right? And that law is what precipitated some of the science to look for carcinogens, OK? And you know what happened in the 1970s and 80s is science started coming back and saying, "Hey, this law doesn't work, right? Because you know it turns out you know it's not so much that there's this little bullet here that's causing the cancer, but it's it's a much more complex set of relationships." Okay. Okay. So we get risk-based decision making, right? So how does all of this? Uh, um, let me, let me step back and try to remember where I am in my presentation. So under risk-based, uh, we get, I've already said this, um, um, implications are that food safety policy and also dietary choice, giving people advice about whether they should eat that nicely charred steak, so on and so forth. Uh, it's not so much seen at, you know, eating something that's pure and wholesome as in getting a kind of optimal balance of stuff in your diet, okay? So here's a comment, right? Um, this really only works functionally as a food safety policy to the extent that we have this grass list, right? Because we can't go through and test everything that's on the market, right? I mean, you know, I mean, just think of all the hundreds of different foods we eat and doing all the kind of toxicology uh, that would be necessary uh, to isolate all the various uh, chemical substances that make up those foods. It's just an incredibly daunting task. And work like this is going on, but it's not going to be finished for 50 or 100 years. And then you add to that that, in fact, no two watermelons are the same, right? They actually all are a little different, right? And they all have a little bit different mix of these things, right? So you just kind of, in order to make a, 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 a functional philosophy of food safety work, you have to have a certain baseline that you're just going to say, this stuff's food, it's okay, right? And that's effectively what the grass list is doing. And then, you know, against this idea that these you know, kind of things that we've been eating since forever are okay, then you look for the, the targets, the things that are particularly problematic, right? The things that may have that uh, toxic or carcinogen, carcinogistic, or that may be, uh, may be actually targets for uh, even uh, microorganisms to, to latch onto, a lot of different mechanisms that could actually affect uh, food safety. Uh, this is actually a slide that goes into the point that I was just making. Why not actually evaluate all these things on ri for risk? Uh, but uh, um, there are actually some technical reasons why uh, it's really hard to go test things that are on the grass list uh, for toxic response. Uh, 
uh, and this is my little uh, uh, nifty graph that shows this, right? The idea is that you know, at a certain dose, that is, you know, consuming a certain amount of something, you get a certain response. You either get sick or you don't, right? And, you know, the idea here is that you've got some sort of a linear relationship. It doesn't have to be a straight line, uh, but some sort of uh, linear relationship between dose and response. The more you uh, eat of it, the sicker you're going to get, right? So, um, in terms of food safety, we're actually looking for uh, responses that are at fairly low doses, right? Uh, if, if you're really trying to find something that causes cancer or disease, uh, it's not going to be something that happens, you know, 30 seconds after you eat that bowl of cornflakes. It's going to happen after you've been eating that bowl of cornflakes for 40 or 50 years, right? <coughs> so we're talking about fairly low, uh, um, low dose responses that we're actually interested in regulating. So the way that you actually uh, solve this problem practically is that in order to find those um, problems, what you do is you actually just raise the dose to ridiculous levels, right? And there's all of this stuff in the newspapers about, you know, how they're making rats drink, you know, 400 bottles of soda pop a day and so on, right? Well, the rationale behind that uh, is that what you're actually doing is raising that dose because then you can actually uh, take this curve and observe a response uh, you know, way down um, at the bottom there, right? And, you know, gosh, when rats drink 400 bottles of soda pop a day, uh, you know, they start dying, right? Um, and uh, the idea here is that then you work down that curve to where the actual uh, dose is in terms of what people are actually eating, and you're able to infer uh, what the risk is. Now this is controversial and it's technical, it's a technical controversy. It's a controversy that if you're in toxicology you get into this in a big way and it, you know, gets debated uh, constantly and, you know, people debate the shape of the dose response curve and the validity of various methods, but this is the basic idea and it's the way that you get at dose response. Yeah. I'm not sure if I should be directing this question to you, but like based on this problem, what is the criteria for which they determine the dose where they intend to test for the food safety issue? Okay, so the idea is that you can estimate how much uh, exposure people are getting in an average diet, right? Now, you know, problems there, right? Some people eat a lot more watermelon than other people, right? But you know, you can, you know, you can actually go out and empirically see how much, how, you know, how much are people, you know, in a particular uh, cultural setting eating of particular kinds of foods or get, you know, what's the, you know, what's the range of exposure that people are actually getting, right? And then you can, you know, and that's what you're interested in, right? You know, you're not really interested in, you know, the case of, you know, 300 bottles a day, right? But you're interested in, you know, people are eating, now they're drinking, you know, two or three diet sodas a day. And, uh, and so what you're doing is you're kind of working backwards from a high level of exposure down to whether or not uh, there's any reasonable risk even at those low, low levels of exposure, right? Now, I mean, I'm, I'm making short work of a lot of complicated science because you do have to, you know, try to figure out what the shape of that curve is and, and, and things like that. Uh, and at the same time, I do feel that shouldn't there be a time factor as well? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You, you're, you're, you might be interested in all of that, but to some extent, um, uh, and a, an assumption that you can make, and then you can debate whether the assumption's valid, is that by raising the dose you actually uh, compensate for some of the time factor things too. So you might have a time lag uh, that uh, you would tend to see uh, at a low dose that you can actually compress the experiment and by raising the dose, right? So these are, it's a sort of very general principle of toxicology that I'm describing here. Okay, this is a philosopher's version of toxicology. Okay, um, but of course the problem is that you know when we're talking about watermelon and tomatoes and peas and so on, uh, you actually get to the point where the rat just explodes before you observe the high level of dose, right? So in terms of the things that are on the grass list, uh, you actually have a there are there are physical limits to how high you can raise the dose, and this has really limited the ability to to do toxic testing, clinical testing on things that are typically on the grass list, and it applies to GM foods too, right? You just can't really 
apply these kinds of toxicological methods to anything that requires you to raise the dose beyond the capacity of an experimental animal to actually consume it, right? So this may be the sense in which they mean it's not a safety assessment in itself, right? Um, that clinical testing is real impossible. So now let's move um, here, and I know I'm running out of time, so I'll try to move through these last few slides pretty quickly. How do people talk about sustainable equivalence in the biotech debate? This is a quote um, uh, from a guy named William Engdahl. I don't really know who he is. Do you know who he is, Alan? He's Canadian. Um, so you should know who he is, right? I thought all Canadians know each other, right? You know, <laughs> drink beer at the hockey games, right? <laughs> so, uh, uh, but at any rate, um, this actually, this quote um, became pervasive on the internet, um, I guess about two or three years ago, and it's mostly disappeared. Uh, but, you know, when I ran it down, um, the earliest date that I could see, and also somebody who clearly was, you know, claiming to take credit for it was this guy, William Engdahl, who runs a policy uh, center in Canada. Uh, and uh, he alleges in here that uh, uh, substantial equivalence was something that was created by the first president, George Bush, and that he just declared by executive order uh, that GMO plants were substantially equivalent to ordinary corn and soybeans. Uh, so this was not a claim that was intended to be friendly to GMOs, right? It makes it sound like just by some sort of executive fiat, uh, uh, some guy named Bush uh, decides that these things are uh, equivalent, right? Which, you know, in our day, even more than in the first President Bush, is kind of like, you know, bad reasoning, right? Um, I, I mean, I hope I've, un I've already said enough about substantial equivalence to suggest that there's more going on to substantial equivalence than just a presidential dec decree. But my sense is that, you know, many anti-GM activists, you know, think that this is the case. Uh, and that's the basis on which they're uh, objecting to substantial equivalence. Okay, so what, what do we want to, what kind of sense do we want to make of this, uh, uh, you know, a little bit more substantively that? Uh, one possibility is that, uh, um, you know, crops from GM and conventional breeding are not significantly different. Uh, a second, slightly nuanced version of that would be that uh, GM and traditionally bred crops are comparable with respect to food safety and environmental risk. Um, and I would suggest that a precautionary approach might actually plausibly reject both of these views in arriving at a less favorable assessment of GM crops. Now in terms of this idea that GM and traditional crops are not significantly different, um, uh, this claim has certainly been tossed out there, uh, but it's actually not been used as a principle in risk assessment. Uh, in, in terms of all of those risk assessment uh, things that I discussed in the coordinated framework, uh, you know, that's kind of equivalent to Bush declaring that they're the same, right? That's just not the way it's been approached. So um, uh, I really don't want to, uh, I want to just kind of dismiss that out of hand and you may, you know, you say, why should I believe Thompson? And that's fine, but uh, um, it, it really is not the way in which regulation proceeds, right? So what about this idea that they're, that GM and conventionally bred crops are comparable with respect to food, and food safety and environmental risk? Now, I haven't actually been talking very much about environmental risk, uh, and I'm out of time, so I'm not going to talk. But let's address this within the context of food safety, because I now do have some background for, for this. And, and we can ask this question, how does uh, the FDA use uh, substantial equivalence in its food safety? I'm going to back up a little bit. I really need to do this. Um, ask the question, um, you know, we could apply the ethics of classification. Um, we could ask, is this a veget you know, are genetically engineered foods vegetarian, kosher, are they wholesome? Um, these just aren't scientific questions, and in fact, uh, they aren't asked and they don't play any role uh, at FDA. Uh, if we think about this in terms of uh, purification, we actually can see some cases where there have been some clear contamination issues, um, uh, and I won't go into these details. Uh, but these are actually cases where uh, substances were ruled by FDA to be non-grass, that is, they, w they were not approved uh, for use in the human food system, uh, and in fact, uh, FDA acted fairly aggressively uh, in both of these cases. <coughs> so when FDA doesn't, you know, sees this as contamination, 
you know, they don't accept it and they act pretty clearly against it. So I guess in one sense the big question is whether or not um, GM constitutes an adulteration of a, a food. And uh, here's the, the graphic that describes the four main um, elements of risk assessment. I know you're getting tired. Uh, and I, I had a debate with myself as to whether or not I, I ought to even stick this in there. But I do think it's helpful to run through the four main elements of risk assessment. They're all tied to each other with air, arrows going in every direction. So the idea is they all inform one another. But the idea of hazard identification is that you have to characterize the basic possible forms of danger, harm, or injury. Uh, you know, how can something bad happen? What, what kind of bad things can happen in connection with this? If we're talking about food safety, uh, you can get sick, you can die, uh, you can throw up, you know, all kinds of things like that. Uh, secondly, you move to this idea of trying to determine how probable those bad things are, right? And that's called either risk measurement or risk quantification, sometimes called just exposure assessment or exposure quantification. And here you're interested in, you know, what sorts of things have to happen before you get sick or what's the likelihood or probability uh, that uh, once you know that, what's the likelihood or probability that each of the various things uh, in that series will actually occur. And then risk gets understood as a function both of the hazard, right, you know, getting sick and dying is much worse than throwing up, right, um, and FDA worries a lot less about things that are going to make you throw up than about the things that are going to make you die. Uh, and it's also a, a, a function of how probable those things are, okay. Um, <clears throat> and then there's this phase of risk management, which is once you have this characterization in terms of hazard and exposure, you actually have a lot of options about how you can address it, right? You can just say, well, who cares? Let's just accept that risk, okay? Uh, you can say, uh, well, let's try to do things that either reduce the probability that will happen or that reduce the severity of the hazard that might be associated with it. Uh, you can introduce compensation or insurance schemes. Uh, you can, uh, you know, get into a process of weighing the competing risks and benefits. All of those things are really different ways uh, to address the question of how you deal with a risk once you know where it is. And then well, I'm not going to say very much about this, but very relevant for anybody who's interested in debating science. Uh, there are these processes of you know, actually obtaining information from uh, you know, people who are making choices and providing information to people who are making choices, uh, conducting ac you know, ac uh, assessment activities uh, that involve uh, various parties and, and so on and so forth. So um, one of the problems um, in a food safety policy is that, I just mentioned this earlier, is that we, the general public really doesn't, hasn't kind of moved beyond purification <laughs> in terms of the way that they understand food safety risk. You know, they kind of have a combination of what I was calling classification and purification, but they really haven't kind of caught on to this balancing thing. And I think people are learning and it's kind of coming about slowly and it's being communicated sometimes in the pages of newspapers. But you've got a kind of a, a really basic communication translation problem just in terms of trying to uh, talk to people uh, and, uh, and, and engage in these kinds of things uh, when we're talking about these uh, 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 complicated kinds of things. So what are you going to do if you're using a risk-best approach? First thing you're going to do is you're going to ask, what are the hazards with a genetically engineered food? Uh, is it toxic? Um, is it, uh, does it cause allergies? Is there something we haven't thought of? Um, and uh, the basic approach that FDA uses here uh, is they uh, presume that uh, DNA codes for RNA and that RNA codes for proteins and that proteins are what's really interesting in terms of food safety. Uh, so they also assume that uh, uh, DNA that uh, is uh, regulating the function of the gene or uh, the location in which things are expressed or that doesn't seem to have any function at all uh, is totally inert. It's not doing anything as it regards food safety. Uh, and they also assume that uh, if you've got a protein that's in a grass food, uh, it's grass. Okay, so if you uh, have a protein, if you're introducing a protein uh, or you're introducing DNA that's ultimately going to result in a protein in a food uh, that uh, is from a food that's grass, uh, it, it doesn't change the grass status of the food. Is, is this making sense to people? Okay. Um, now if we look at this, um, 
let me see what I've got here. Oh, there is an exception to this, and that relates to allergens. Because if you have a, you know, Brazil nuts are, uh, an al you know, they have allergens in them, uh, but uh, they're, on, you know, they're on the grass list, right? But if you introduce a, pro uh, a, a DNA from a grass food that is a known allergen, then actually that principle I just described doesn't apply. They treat that as if it's a, you know, totally new food and has to go through the whole system. And in fact, people just quit trying to develop genes from known allergen, allergen foods. So uh, if you have a new protein, and this was the case with Starlink corn, and it's the case with uh, if you're developing a, a plant that produces a pharmaceutical, if you, you have a, a new protein that gets produced in this food, that's treated just like a, an additive, and you have to go through uh, tons of toxicological tests. And to my knowledge, nobody's done that, right? Why would they do it? Right? They just don't, it just doesn't get called food, right? You don't have anybody that's actually submitted toxicological data on a protein produced by transgenes? Okay. There's just, that's the only one. That, okay. It's the only one that, that has officially gone through the grass <coughs> determination. Okay. <coughs> okay. So that's what substantial equivalence run, uh, you know, basically amounts to. Um, how would somebody who was a precautionary advocate argue with this? Well, I think there are a couple of things that they might question. One is, uh, uh, you know, this basic assumption that uh, the only thing that we really need to be looking at at the end of the day are the proteins, and the other one is that uh, uh, this non-coding DNA uh, just doesn't have any relevance. And certainly some of the people who are more scientifically inclined uh, have questioned those assumptions. So how would you be a precautionary advocate and object to um, substantial equivalence and sort of still re, you know, sit within the domain of science? I think this is how you do it. And I don't have anything to say about this. You know, I'm a poor philosopher. <clears throat> this is kind of consistent with the idea of do not require proof of harm before acting. Uh, and it's kind of consistent with the idea of using minimax rules and risk assessment. So here's where I stand, right? I mean, I'm personally satisfied with the way this works. I'm not particularly worried about the safety of GMM foods, but I do think that there's room for disagreement. Uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, you know, the, di the disagreement can come in a couple of places. One is sort of this whole risk-based approach. This is not something that's gonna be unique to genetically engineered foods. And you might say, well, gee, we need to be just testing more things, or the whole framework needs to be mandatory. Those would be very legitimate kinds of points to dispute, but they're not gonna be focused specifically on GM. They're really gonna apply to the whole food safety system. Uh, and also, with respect to some of these assumptions, uh, that I've just made about, uh, noted about the way that uh, hazards get made in genetic modification. I probably better stop. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I got a few more slides, but they don't say much. I mean, basically, the, the thing that my last slides say uh, is that um, they kind of go back to this uh, FAO versus w FDA thing. And uh, in fact, it's very difficult to figure out how uh, something like substantial, uh, the, the FA, F, FAO document implies that you're using substantial equivalence as a general approach in risk assessment. And it's very difficult to figure out how you would apply what I've described here in environmental risk assessment. And in fact, the U.S. agencies that do environmental risk assessment don't, don't really use substantial equivalence. They have very different principles that they use uh, in risk assessment, and, but getting into the nitty gritty of that will take us even deeper. Here. In fact, and it's not in fact, it's not the case in the regulatory system. I'm not sure where I have to, there it is. Right, I don't endorse this. Then, and it's, it's just not, I mean, it's not in fact the way that, that uh, substantial equivalence is used in the regulatory system in the United States or the way that it functions in international debates. Um, you know, to sort of go back to this jargon, and I know I, I I, you know, kind of go back to my, my, my four basic principles of risk assessment slide. Um, where the hell is that? Uh, you know, really the place where substantial equivalence functions in the regulatory procedure is in the hazard identification box, okay? Uh, 
So uh, if, if something is determined to be, to meet substantial equivalence criteria, uh, then that bears on whether or not um, it's regarded as uh, um, having particular kinds of hazards associated <coughs> with it. But it's, so it's a decision that's made within the overall uh, risk assessment. It's, it's a determination that's made within risk assessment, but it's not the decisive determination uh, as to whether or not uh, a product should be considered acceptable or not. Yeah. Well, I, I guess forgive me if I don't frame this question properly, but um, I'm, I'm personally working on, on some cisgenics as uh -huh. opposed to transgenic crops. Right. And um, I guess I'd like to know what your thoughts on that are uh, from like a philosophical or ethical point of view. Because I, I know they're not different fundamentally from a scientific point of view. Right. But I feel that they are ethically. Okay. Explain <laughs> the, yeah. Go ahead. Why don't you explain the term? Oh, okay. Um, so transgenics are things like BT corn, where you're taking a gene from a bacteria and putting it into something that's not the same species of bacteria, basically. But cisgenics would be taking a gene from a variety of corn and genetically engineering another variety of corn with that same gene. So it's something that could theoretically have arisen from traditional breeding, but we used genetic engineering instead. So it's clear that this is going to pass all the substantial equivalence tests because not only is it already in a food, it's in the same food, right? And the question is, I mean, I guess, you know, what to me the question is, is that should we be worried about this? And I think that there are reasons why if you take this precautionary, if you take a precautionary approach, you know, you can apply some of the specific precautionary questions to cisgenics as much as you can to transgenics, right? Because um, you know, there, there's a kind of a presumption that the specific location of the gene doesn't make much difference. Uh, and there's a, a presumption that by uh, using these genetic methods that you haven't done anything that could, um, you know, sort of mess up other regulatory components of the plant. Now, I mean, I, I, I think that uh, those are the kind of things that somebody taking a precautionary approach would be worried about. I think there are probably some replies that can be made to those, and the replies basically require you to get into what happens in ordinary plant breeding. And, and you know, I think the reason, my, in my experience, the reason why, uh, you know, plant scientists aren't particularly worried about this is that they, you know, they think of themselves, you know, forgive me, Alan, but they, they think of themselves as doing incredible violence to plants all the time, and this is comparatively tame in, in, you know, when compared to other stuff that they do and get away with, right? You know, so, so you know, they're, they're you know, it, and, and to be not quite so facetious about it, you know, it's not so much the introduction of the genetic novelty that's the critical factor in the safety of a new plant, it's, you know, looking at the way the plant actually functions when you put it out in the field and grow it and, you know, whether or not you uh, can, uh, uh, you know, whether or not it, it, it's, its behavior looks strange or weird or, you know, and, and, you know, a whole variety of things that just have to be done. I mean, part of the lore, I think anybody who goes through a plant uh, a science curriculum gets, you know, told these stories about ordinary potato breeders who introduce toxins into their potatoes, you know, doing nothing that seems, you know, particular scary or freaky. Um, but, you know, there are parts of the potato plant that are toxic and it's very easy in the course of crossing two potatoes to get the toxic bits into the part that we eat. And that's not a good thing, right? So if you're a plant breeder, you watch out for stuff like that. And, and if you want to know why our foods are safe to eat, you know, it actually is the kind of professional ethics of plant breeders more than anything else that makes them safe. It really has much more to do with that than it does to do with the FDA. Um, and sometimes when I say that, people are, are comforted, and sometimes when I, people, I, I say that, people are just sort of horrified. So, you know, <laughs> it partly depends on what you think about plant breeders, I guess. Um, but I do think that that's why it works, and um, I'm enough of a, uh, I don't know what I am. I don't know what, how to put a name on this, but I, you know, I, I actually, I'm one of the people that's more comforted by that. You know, I just don't place as much faith in, uh, you know, technically elaborate regulatory systems that are specified with the kind of, the way that it has to be because it has legal 
uh, you know, has legal significance. I don't put, put, put as much significance of that as I do into, you know, the kind of, you know, goodwill and responsibility of a community of people who are trying to, you know, I mean, they're not setting out to, you know, produce plants that are going to make us sick. And, uh, um, and, and historically, you know, they haven't had any, you know, any benefit. They couldn't have derived any benefit from producing a plant that would make us sick, right? You know, maybe that's changed and maybe that's worth debating. Is, so I don't know if I've answered your question, but I do think that, that you know, there are, are challenges that could be made just as much to cisgenics as to transgenics. Um, and if you are concerned about some of these assumptions, then you probably should be just as concerned about cisgenics as you are about transgenics. It would be my, my sort of being logically consistent response. That's more of a scientific response, so I'm wondering if there are any differences after So, uh, so I guess, I mean, I don't think, no. I, I mean, that's, this is my answer. I don't think that there's any difference. Now, if your basis for being concerned about eating a plant is that I don't want to eat a tomato that has an animal gene in it because I'm a vegetarian, right? And somehow, you know, the way that I understand uh, vegetarianism uh, is that there shouldn't be any animal genes in anything that I eat, right? Um, you know, whether or not that's a philosophically um, defensible or, you know, helpful way to think about vegetarianism is kind of a separate question, but if we've gotten to that point, then I think you might think there was something significant about crossing species boundaries. But um, crossing species boundaries, here's just a general comment. I think that's been a big issue in the medical bio, much bigger issue in the medical biotech debate than it has been in the agricultural biotechnology debate. Uh, and. Um, um, and oftentimes the way that it's come into the ag biotech debate is from people who have uh, been worried about the idea that the human species has some sort of special status and you know getting animal genes or uh, some other kind of genes into the human gene pool would be ethically problematic for for some kind of reason and so then they take this crossing species boundaries theme and and stick it into the biotech debate but you know and you know and I, I, you know, I have to respect people that are worried about that, but on the other hand, the people that are really focused on the food system and things like food safety and agricultural production, you know, e you know even you know, organic uh, opponents of uh, GMOs are not particularly worried about that kind of stuff, okay? Yeah? Do you anticipate that GMOs are ever going to become mainstream or commonplace here anywhere else in the world? Well, you know, when I started in this business, and I first published my first paper on GMOs in 86, and I got, um, uh, I, I actually was directed a center focused on ethical and policy issues in ag biotech at Texas A&M that got started in about uh, 89, 90. I predicted at that time that our center would have a useful lifespan of about five to seven years, and by that time it would be completely mainstream, right? So you probably don't want to ask me that question. I have a very bad record of uh, of, of responding to that. Um, you know. Well, has there been headways since then? Well, you know, in some respects, um, it's it's very surprising. i I think that this is a much less a contentious issue in Europe today than it was uh, seven, eight years ago. Um, on the other hand, uh, the main biotech companies uh, for reasons that have partly to do with public acceptance and a lot to do with the regulatory system are moving away from transgenics and they're using a lot of uh, marker-assisted selection and uh, you know, in, in some respects it looks like for the foreseeable future, which is maybe a 10-year horizon, uh, we're going to see a lot more products like that than we are transgenics. Where we'll see transgenics are in things that are relatively controlled production. So we'll see transgenics to produce pharmaceuticals and industrial products, but in terms of foods, you know, I just don't see that happening over the short run. Yeah. Can you uh, comment at all on the more social and environmental aspects of the GM debate? Because you're, you're talking a lot about food safety, but so much of the debate is not about food safety, but it's about the, the social costs to, right. to farmers. Right. 
and um, <coughs> the potential environmental costs, um, you know, again, to farmers or also to you know, right. resources. So on the social side, there was a, a debate that got very hot in the um, 80s. Uh, over uh, th th that had been, it actually has a history, and I'll try to be brief. But you know, this is this is where I run the risk of talking for days, right? Some people ask me questions like that. In the seven in the seventies, there was a famous lawsuit against the University of California for the work that they had done on a mechanical tomato harvester. Uh, and it was claimed that this work had uh, led to a dramatic consolidation in the tomato industry and had put a lot of tomato workers out of business, out of work. Okay, this was what was alleged in the lawsuit, and uh, the suit was actually successful on the first round. Ultimately, as it went through the appeal process, University of California finally won. Uh, but the idea was that, as a public institution, uh, they should not be developing. Uh, technologies that disadvantage sm small farmers, right? And I don't know what the numbers were, but it was something like, you know, in one year, California had 350 tomato growers, and five years later they had 17 or something like that. It was in, in that range, you know. So, um, uh, and you know, it had to do with the fact that tomato harvesters are expensive, and you had to be a big farmer to buy one, and you know, long story, right? So there got to be this in the late 70s and well into the 80s, there got to be a fairly entrenched uh, group within kind of ag politics who were really worried about these kinds of things. And this is when biotech started coming on the scene. And uh, uh, so this was something that was debated very hotly in the 1980s. Uh, one of the first social science papers that was published on a biotech product predicted, and this was a B, uh, BST or, B, or, or BGH, as it's sometimes referred to, recombinant bovine som somatotropin, which predicted that this would lead to uh, consolidation in the dairy industry. And uh, so this created a, a, a tremendous amount of, it really hardened people's positions uh, small farm advocates were anti-GMO. Um, it's not entirely clear, um, let me, to put it mildly, that most biotech products have the kind of scale bias that the tomato harvester did, uh, because uh, uh, it's not at all clear uh, that uh, small farmers uh, can't use them just as effectively as large farmers. Uh, so. That's a very debatable point, and I tend to agree with the, the people that would suggest that most of these biotech products are going to be scale neutral. There may be some exceptions, right? What is sort of organic versus GMO? And well, so, you know, or the organic versus GMO story. I mean, part of what happened there is, you know, when FDA, when USDA was writing its organic standards, they originally uh, were going to allow genetically engineered uh, crops as, as organic. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, uh, largely because the organic community overlapped with the small farm community to a si significant extent. There were a lot of people in the organic community that were opposed to GMOs because they saw them as uh, antithetical to the interests of small farmers. And, uh, and, and so partly with their instigation, uh, you know, there was a, a, a public comment campaign that was launched at, you know, health food stores and organic stores all over the country. And, and the USDA got more negative public comment on the proposal to allow GM and its organic standards than they had on any other issue in their history, right? So, you know, they sort of listened to people and said, okay, so, you know, it's not organic. That wasn't a, a decision that was based on any kind of uh, risk assessment or environmental concern. It was just based on, you know, this is what the people that want organic food want. They want non-GMO. And it was also the case, um, you know, at the risk of rambling even more, that, you know, one of the weaknesses in the U.S. system at that time is that FDA was not allowing even negative labels. They were not allowing you to say that this is not genetically modified. They had decided that that was a misleading label. So uh, there was no way for people who had, you know, whatever kind of reason to not eat GM that they might have had to avoid GM. So you had those two things working together and it resulted in the policy that we've got now. I mean, there's a lot of people, I mean, it's the minority of, of people in organics, but there's still, a, there's a lot of people now that would like to revisit that issue because they think that there are types of genetic modification, particularly things that are focused on disease resistance, that you know would be great for organic growers and are per perfectly consistent with the organic philosophy. Uh, so there's 
you know, some initial conversation now, uh, but I think that, you know, for the most part, uh, I mean, I spend a lot of time with, with people who work in that area, and, and you know, uh, most of them are not willing. They're very suspicious of you if you start saying things like that. They figure that you have to have some alter al al you know, ulterior motive for even raising the suggestion that GM could be compatible with organic. Have you read uh, Pam Ronald's book? No, I haven't. This is the she's, she's from. Her husband. Yeah, I've people have told me about this, yeah, but I haven't read it. Good. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I yeah, she's a Davis uh, she's scientist. A Davis scientist working on uh, biotechnology, and her husband is an organic farmer producer, and they, they put this uh, book together, um, and it's it's a very interesting read because I, I think they quite compellingly indicate that they they can be mm -hmm. compatible. Uh, What's the book called? You know, I'm trying to remember I can't remember I either. Desk, Tomorrow's I, table. Uh, just Tomorrow's yeah. table, right. That's and it. And I second that. It's yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, coming from Europe, I think um, much of the resistance, a lot of the resistance in Europe to GMOs is belongs to like the companies who own the, the, the gene or the pet and all those, those plants, and especially if you go to the developing countries and right. they sell the food there, and then or their seeds there, but then they can, you know, <coughs> see them. they have to buy the next generation again from those companies. I think that a lot of opposition comes. Right. I think those are complicated questions and, uh, and very open, debatable uh, questions about the application of the technology in the developing world and the extent to which uh, if Africa opens up to GMOs, are they also opening up to Monsanto? Uh, and, uh, you know, those are, are deep questions that are worth debating. Um, and uh, it, it, on the website, some of the products that are being discussed are, are right in the thick of those kinds of questions. Um, matter of fact, I think all three of those products are right in the thick of those questions that relate to developing countries. And, you know, really nothing that I've said here uh, relates to that. And, and I guess my general comment, you know, looked at from a regulatory standpoint, um, you know, we don't regulate in the U.S. based on what the impact is going to be in Africa. And uh, in point of fact, our regulatory agencies are pretty much precluded from doing that. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, you know, there's really no way for a U.S. regulatory agency, you know, the U.S. is interested in what's the impact going to be in, in the United States. And there can certainly be certain kinds of products, genetically engineered or not, they're perfectly safe to grow environmentally in the United States that you wouldn't want to grow in a different, you know, climate or in a different ecosystem. And uh, so those are, you know, are questions that have occasionally been raised by the scientific uh, community but uh, have not been taken seriously by our government. Well, I think we're out of time. Okay. Thank you.